The word principles, let's define it. Principle comes from the Latin noun principia. Principia means first, foremost, leading, chief, or most necessary. It is that which matters most. It is the first things that must be understood before anything else can be understood. Principles have to come first. I'm attempting to take this information out of hiding. It's been hidden. The hiding of it is destroying the fabric of our society and putting us into bondage. It needs to come out and be non-hidden. It needs to be unveiled and shared widely and freely with anybody who's capable of accepting it and comprehending it now. And this is the problem. Our society does not put principles first. It puts trivialities first, and we're no longer a society that even cares about principles or first things. So first things first. First things or principles have to come first. These are the seven general principles of natural law. Many people who have studied some variants of occultism may recognize these as what are known as the hermetic principles. There is a, a moral obligation to bring this information to the public now. The principle of mentalism states that the all, everything in creation, is actually a manifestation of mind. The all is mind. Okay? What this means is everything that happens has to be a result of a mental state which preceded it. Everything. For anything to exist, thoughts had to form first, and then they formed the physical reality after. The universe itself is a mental construct of the Creator. Thoughts lead to the manifestation of things and events. Thoughts create conditions. Thoughts create things and conditions. They cannot just magically manifest themselves. Thought comes first. Thoughts create our state of existence and the quality of our experience here on Earth, ultimately. Therefore, we should be responsible for everything that we create by being responsible for that which we think because the thought processes are what are driving the behaviors. People behave the way they do because they have certain belief systems embedded in the mind and running like a program. Their thoughts and their emotions are driving their actions. So the behavior is not magically suddenly gonna just change. The thoughts and emotions have to change because they're the driving force behind the behavior. That's when reality will change. See, people don't want to hear that, once again. They don't want to hear, if you want to change reality, you, yourself, have to change the way you think. Because the way you think is not conducive to the requirements for getting what you say you want. They're doing the exact opposite of that in many cases. So that's the principle of mentalism. The principle of correspondence states that that which is above is similar or like to that which is below. So what this means is that which is below uh, and that which is below is like to that which is above. It's a mirror, okay? The above is like the below, the below is like the above, all right? The above in this case is the macrocosm, okay? The, the laws of the very large things, okay? The laws that govern the creation which we consider is seemingly outside of ourselves. So the macrocosm were the very large, the totality of everything, and the microcosm, which is the very small, or the individuated units that comprise the whole in their aggregate, okay? They are reflections of each other. They cannot be separated from each other. As one goes, the other goes. The universe is actually a holographic system. It's a hologram, is an image, okay? You pass a, a laser through it, and it then projects a 3D image, okay? It's like a flat image, and it projects a three-dimensional image. But the aspect, why they call it a hollow, like holistic hologram, holistic image, is if you break a hologram into multiple components by cutting it. So if I take a hologram and I cut it in four pieces, you don't have a quarter of the image on one part of the hologram and a quarter on the other and a quarter on the third and a quarter on the fourth. You have four whole images that only lose their resolution by a quarter. 
So everything is contained in all the smaller parts, okay? That's the, like the reality that we're living in. Our universe is a holographic one. So the universe is inside the individual. And the entire universe is like an individual. They're reflections of each other. The other part of the principle of correspondence is that our reality is also fractal in nature. Now, if you studied fractals, these are self-similar mathematical generated patterns, okay? We see this through things like Fibonacci sequence in, in mathematics, and this is repeated endlessly throughout nature. You look at the um, structure of the atom, and it's similar to the structure of the solar system, which is similar to the structure of the galaxy. They work the same way, they look the same. You pull back enough, you'll keep seeing the same pattern repeat. So, uh, the universe is both holographic, meaning that the whole is contained in the parts and vice versa, and it is fractal or self-similar across all scales of its existence. That's the principle of correspondence. The principle of vibration simply states that there is no such thing as rest, as dead or, or non-motion, okay? Death, in that sense, is an illusion because true death would be the cessation of all motion and energy. There is no such thing, it doesn't exist. You cannot go anywhere in creation where something is com at complete rest. Everything moves, everything vibrates, and at the most fundamental level, the universe and every single thing which comprises it is ultimately pure vibratory energy that is manifesting itself in different ways, different frequencies, different vib vibratory forms. The universe has no true solidity as such, as we imagine solidity at the macrocosmic level. Matter is merely energy in a state of vibration. So nothing is truly solid. You know, it's, it's, a, it's again, like we say, we are spirit having a human experience. The whole universe is spiritual, having a, a, a experience in solidity, all right? That's how you have to look at the principle of vibration. The principle of polarity states that everything has a dual nature to it. There are polarities in everything that exists, okay? Everything has poles, everything has its pair of opposites. However, opposites, they, they are identical in nature, but they're different in degree. So let me give you an example of what that means. Are hot and cold really opposites? Or can we simply look at them as the presence of heat energy or the absence of heat energy? meaning that they're the same thing, energy. And whether it's concentrated in a specific area, which would make it hot, or whether it's absent from a specific area, which would make it cold, okay? That's what hot and cold are at the fundamental level. At our level of perception, they're opposites, but at the fundamental level, they're the same thing, energy or, it's, or lack thereof. Extremes can meet and blend and, you know, play with each other like as depicted in the yin-yang symbol, masculine and feminine, they need to be blended. And at some level of reality, everything that is seemingly contradictory may be reconciled. Now again, I stress the term at some level. At the unified field level, this everything is consciousness, pure consciousness. However, at this level, there are differences in consciousness. At this level, there are things that are taking place that we need to understand. At this level, there are things that we need to set right and rectify because it does matter. It does matter. So again, be careful with some of the new age-isms that get put out there. Yes, do it, can all paradoxes be reconciled? At some level. In this realm, we need to have our feet on the ground in the physical domain. Let's look at the principle of rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. Okay, so everything has a rhythm to it or a swing to it. There's tendencies that exist in energy. The pendulum swing manifests in everything that we undergo, everything that we perceive. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. It's just an opposite. It's perceived as an opposite. Rhythm will compensate. Now, what this, how this should be understood when we are talking about natural law is many people will say, well, that's just the way the tendency is moving us. It's just the way the tide is taking us, right? But that's not really accurate. 
Okay, we can't look at these things as that the rhythms are set in stone and it has to be this way now, right? One of the things that a lot of the hermetic tradition taught regarding these laws, the, these principles, were they can be overcome by higher levels of consciousness. Okay, this one was one of them. Rhythm is a principle that is a tendency for something to swing a certain way. Let's look at it as you have a boat, you want to row the boat out to sea, right? You have to get past the tide, you have to get past the breakers and the waves. And if that tide's really strong at high tide, it's going to be very much more difficult, you're going to have to expend more energy to get it out to sea. If, however, you were taking it when the current's moving out to sea, okay, there, there's a, a flow that's moving outward deeper into the ocean, and you start rowing that boat then, you're going to be able to do it much more easily. Okay, so if there's if there's winds pushing along a plane, it's going to have to expend less energy. It's going to get there qu more quickly, okay, because it's adding to the energy. If, however, you're flying against the wind, you got to expend a lot more energy. It's just a tendency. You can still get to where you want to go. You may just have to exert more effort. So that's the principle of rhythm. This is the principle here in natural law that most fits in with how I'm using the term natural law today, cause and effect. Many people, again, in the new age community, don't want to believe that there's causes and effects and that effects are driven by causes that, you know, come first and then manifest conditions. So the principle of cause and effect simply states that every cause has its effect and every effect has its cause. Uh, every single thing that occurs happens according to law, all right? Chance is a name for law, a law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. So again, is there free will? Yes, there is free will. But is there free will to ignore law without consequence? No, there is not. That's the limit of free will. Free will is operating within boundary conditions that I'm referring to as natural law. It's a series of laws, actually, okay? Free will operates within these parameters or boundary conditions that cannot be exceeded or gone beyond without consequence. Oh yeah, you can break natural law. Yes, you can break it, but you cannot break it without consequence. You cannot break it without consequence negative consequence. And that's why this body of knowledge has in the past been referred to as consequentialism. It is the knowledge of how consequences are generated by our free will decision-making processes within the boundaries of natural law. Will the effect happen immediately? No, it will not happen immediately. There is a time lag. You set the cause into motion, the universe is going to intelligently bring to you, through a rearrangement of all the dynamics that it needs to rearrange, the effect of what you've generated by setting that cause into motion. And there is a time gap between the, the cause going into place and the effect coming around and hitting you. This is why the pattern recognition of cause and effect is more difficult because it is separated by a time lag, by what we perceive as linear time. Now, if you did a wrong to somebody and immediately you were stung by a wasp, every single time you did a wrong to somebody, it showed up and bit you immediately within two seconds of you hurting somebody, stealing from somebody, lying to somebody, etc. Would you start to connect the stinging to the wrong that you did? I think most people would see the pattern. They would recognize the pattern. But since that doesn't happen, and there's a time lag to, gener to experiencing something harmful to ourselves once we do something harmful to other people, it's very difficult for people to see the, the connection through the time lag. So this is ultimately gonna come back and bite us. you know. And what we set into motion is gonna actually topple over onto us if we don't change our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. The, the next thing that needs to be understood is the two planes, all right? There's the plane of effects, and then there's the plane of causes. No power to affect any change lies on the plane of effects. 
which is the physical manifested reality. Again, what already is, nothing can be done about. What already is, you cannot change. You cannot change the past. You can change what it is starting now and make sure that it gets changed in the future. But right now, what is, is the truth, and all you can do is accept that or reject it. You can't change the past. So the physical world that is manifested up to this point happened because of things that occurred in the past. The causes happened in the past. Nothing you can do about that right now. The plane of effects or the physical world is where manifested realities have already occurred, have already taken shape, have already formed due to their underlying causal factors. The plane of effects constitutes that which has already occurred. As such, no power to affect change lies here because that which has already occurred cannot unoccur. That which has occurred can't undo itself. It happened, it's already done. It has become that which is, or truth. Human consciousness seems to be trapped upon the plane of effects, meaning that humanity as a whole remains ignorant of the underlying causes, causes which they themselves have set into motion and which lead to self-inflicted suffering in their lives. So if you're trapped at this level, what you're doing is you're looking at the symptoms and you're stuck looking at the symptoms. So let's look at the plane of causality. This is the other plane. This is the mental realm, the mental world. Again, according to the law of mentalism, the first principle of natural law, everything that manifests must first manifest in mind before it can manifest physically. So again, if the plane of causality is the mental world that's generating the causes in mind, okay, everything is happening there first, and then it is trickling down to the physical domain. It is manifesting in the physical domain only after it has manifested in the mental world. The plane of causality is where causes are set into motion prior to those causes manifesting as formed realities in the plane of effects. The final principle of the um, seven principles of natural law, at least the, the formalized ones, are gender. Gender exists in everything. Everything has its masculine and its feminine components or principles. We've already seen that when it comes to the human brain, consciousness, worldview, etc. Gender manifests on all planes of existence. Spiritual, mental, physical, everything. Very simple concept. What I want to briefly talk about is mental gender. Mental gender is the state of coexistence between the masculine and feminine aspects of the mind. Our left brain hemisphere largely facilitates the masculine aspects of the mind, or the intellect, logic, analytical thought, linear thought processes, while the right brain hemisphere largely facilitates the feminine aspect, or intuition, meaning creativity, compassion, and holistic thought processes. This next section is what I call the lost principle. This is the eighth principle of natural law, which binds all of the other principles together. It is what I would call the encapsulating principle. Okay, it's the container inside which all the other principles fit very nicely and neatly. You hear very few other researchers, even people who are studying this from the occult perspective, who are studying this from the consequentialism perspective, you very hear them incorporate the eighth and all-encompassing principle. This pattern is called something. Does anybody know what this pattern is called? The seed of life. Now, what happens from a seed? grows, it generates something, it creates something. A seed has an outer casing, an outer shell, that if you're going to get to the inner core of it that contains all of the creative, genetic, generative material, okay, that shell has to be there and intact. You break the shell of the seed, the creative essence of the seed is going to be gone. Now, what is that principle? Here's what that principle is. It's the eighth or what I call the lost principle. And it's the thing that has to be present in order for any change to manifest itself. And it is not what most people think of it as. Even when I tell you what this is, I guarantee you there will be an inaccurate connotative meaning for what people think this means, okay? Here's what the eighth principle is. It is known as the generative principle or the principle which governs 
creation, which actually is the causal factor that goes into effect and generates the result that we say that we want. But what's the real term for it? Who can guess what the actual term, what the generative principle of creation actually is? The generative principle is care. Now, this is different than compassion. People say, why don't you use the word compassion? Because that's not what I'm talking about. It is a different concept than compassion or even what I would describe as love. This means, what are you giving attention and helping to grow? What are you focusing upon? Because what focus you're focusing upon, that's what's ultimately getting generated, getting created, and growing. And this doesn't mean be ignorant of what's going on in the world and don't look at anything that's negative because you're going to feed that and give power to it. That's not what it means. That means you know what you're feeding? In that instance, if you want to do that, you're feeding ignorance. And that's what's going to grow. It's the exact opposite that the New Agers want you to believe that it is. By ignoring the negative, you are ensuring that more of it occurs. You are fueling it by ignorance, ensuring that it grows and takes over. What care has to be looked at here as is, this is what you're giving your energy to. This is what you're focused upon. This is what you actually care enough about to do, to spend your time on, to put your attention on, to manifest in the world. That's what I'm talking about as care. That's what generates our experience in the aggregate. Most people don't care about what's really happening. Therefore, it is an impossibility for us in the aggregate to change the direction of energy, to change the direction of consciousness, and ultimately to get what we say we want. That's how the real law of attraction works. Here's how it actually operates. The loss principle is the dynamic of care. What we care about on a day-to-day -day basis acts as the driving force of our thoughts and actions. What did I say we need to develop? The heart, mind, guts, right? Heart, mind, guts, in that order. Care comes first. You gotta care enough to know, to develop the knowledge, okay? Then you gotta act on it and put it into practice. Apply it. So that's the order. Heart, mind, guts. Care, knowledge, action. Those are the steps. And all three of those have to be in place. All three. That's what unity consciousness is. It's unifying thoughts, emotions, and actions. The three aspects of consciousness, such that there is no contradiction between them. Our thoughts, what we say, what, what, what we think, how we feel and how we act are one and the same. There's no contradiction. That's unity consciousness. Care is the driver of our thoughts and actions. It ultimately can be seen as the generator of the quality of our shared experience here on the earth. Care is what generates the whole thing. Hence, it has been called the generative principle. Liken the heart to a pump in the body. Well, what does a pump do? It's a generator. It provides energy. It moves the life force through the blood, in the body. In every ancient tradition, they talk about the life force being in the blood. The heart is what pumps that through the whole physiology and enables us to continue to sustain life, okay? The heart is the generator, it's the pump. It's the center of the being. As important as the brain is, which we just talked about the importance of it, the heart is ultimately what's generating the experience because what we care about determines what we think about on a daily basis most of the time and therefore how we behave. And anybody familiar with the compasses and square symbol of Freemasonry with the G in the middle? Well, that's what the G stands for at the highest level. You'll talk about many, many porch masons. These are the exoteric masons that are given the teachings of the profane and they think they're in the know. Okay, they're given the, the information, well, this only means geometry, it only means God, etc. Okay, one of the things they'll tell you it means in, at a slightly higher level is that it means gnosis, knowledge. At a higher level, at illuminated levels of Freemasonry, which are above 30, 32nd degree, 
they will give you what the real meaning of the G inside the compasses and square is. And it is the generative principle. It means genesis, creation. And yeah, you can tie that right back to God. I'm not saying those things are different. And the, the forms that get created in the physical manifested world are geometric forms. So it is geometry as well. It's all these things. But at the highest level, it's the generative principle. That's what that G really stands for in esoteric Freemasonry. It's called the generative principle because that means to create. It comes from, the word generative comes from Latin, the verb genere, as we've already talked about, means to create. The generative principle is what we create through. And it's lost because people don't care. They don't have care. Hence, it's the lost principle. Okay? Here's how it works, folks. What we care enough to put our will behind. So again, heart, mind, guts. Guts is the will. The action, the masculine principle. That's what gets, gets things done ultimately in the physical domain. What we care enough to put our will behind. And that's driven by the care. That's the generator or the pump that drives the will. What we care enough to put our will behind is ultimately what gets created or manifested in our world. The world is the way that it is because most people do not care enough, even if they say, they pay lip service, okay, and say that they want things to be different. They don't care enough to actually change it through their actions. What it comes down to is preventing action. Preventing action. That's what the New Age community is designed to do. They want people inactive because the dark occultists know that the thing that is ultimately generating our reality is behavior. Action is what's generating the reality. That gets generated through what we care about because our cares and our desires drive our actions. So most people will say they want things to change, but then when you say, what are you doing to make that change happen? Not a word. Silence comes back on the other end. They don't care enough to change it through their actions. That's what the generative or lost principle is about. And until that principle is regained and people get out of their laziness and most of all get out of their cowardice. Again, in that New Age lecture, I'm talking about what it ultimately comes down to in the New Age movement. And I'll look at any New Ager in the eyes. They're cowards. Cowards. Ultimately, they know the evil that we're up against, and they intend to do not a damn thing about it. That's what it really, that's what it really comes down to. And anybody telling you it's different than that is lying to you. They're cowards. Period. And I'll say it right to any of their faces. Anything I say up here, I'll, anybody that believes in that nonsense, come and bring them to me. I'll tell them right to their face. Straight and open, just like I said it here. Because I don't care. So, I'm telling you, this religion has to go. It's got to go. If people are going to make real change happen, the idea that it can't be done, uh, that it can be done without taking actual real world action has to be purged from human consciousness. Reality does not work like that, period, the end. I, and I can't make you accept that. I recognize I can't make anybody in this room accept that. All I can do is put it out there for your consideration, and if you have some common sense and really, really think about it, you'll understand what I'm saying here is absolutely the way it is. Many people want to deceive you through these religious notions, which is all about getting people to stand down and accept their chains. That's what that religion's in place for.